process. And that can't be valid. Um, <clears throat> and I traced it, like Acharya Tulsi and, and Mahapragya, back to a lack of spirituality in Marx. In Marx himself, there's no real ethics, which is unfortunate. So, <clears throat> anyway, we had this wonderful um, conference on Zoom. You can listen to it. It's going to be on YouTube soon, I hope. And um, Dr. Gandhi's speech was very moving, and he talked about this early time, his communist history, and then he worked in education as a headmaster, and he eventually ended up working full-time for the Anuviba International Jain Peace Organization that promotes this spiritual approach to nonviolence. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, there we are, and there were some great people talking and um, yeah, hats off to everyone involved with that. And if my little book of peace declarations, four volumes, can help, I think it can. It's the first time anyone has ever done it. I don't know why. I suppose that's why I'm here, to do new stuff. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do when you do a PhD. You do something original. So I did. I invented transpersonal history as a tool for conflict resolution. Um, and now I keep inventing new stuff. So... <laughs> I, I invented the idea of putting all these peace declarations into one volume from all the different sectors and spheres of peace activity. So it should be a reference book in every academic library in the world, um, and particularly those with an interest in international relations, peacemaking, conflict resolution, etc. But also comparative philosophy and religion, because those treaties are in there as well. You know, the world is in danger in jeopardy uh, because... Because we haven't focused enough on the peace thinking that we need to be doing. We focused instead on ruthless profit making or ruthless ideological uh, you know, um, bandwagons that, that different cultures promote. And as I said in my talk in honour of Dr. Gandhi, the most important thing the Jain tradition stands for in peacemaking is non-absolutism. This is what Acharya Tulsi and Mahapragya absolutely insisted on. The Jains have this brilliant, sophisticated intellectual heritage going back to the last Tirthankara, Mahavira, that you don't attach to any particular uh, biased view of reality. There may be one God, there may be lots of gods, there may be no God. We're not really, to be honest, in a position to absolutely know the truth about all that. So we should suspend judgment. We should adopt the many-sidedness of truth as a as a methodological position and that brings peace of soul as we get on with the spiritual work that makes a non-violent world possible um, and that that was transmitted to the west by Piro of Ellis a great Greek philosopher and it was transmitted and became known as skepsis or skepticism which actually means the suspension of judgment that um, you don't we can't decide these ultimate things right now Therefore, let's suspend judgment and agree to get on. Um, because on this human plane of existence, those ultimate truths are not, you know, they're very hard to find. As Kant said, it's like our minds are not capable of downloading the absolute thing in itself, the, the absolute knowledge of the Godhead, if you want. Although, obviously, every philosopher and sage who's ever tried to think these things through has tried. But, you know, uh, it's difficult. Um... So let's not sing and dance on each other's graves and say, well, I've got the absolute truth, you're a demon, and my armies are going to kill yours. I mean, that's a demonic sort of world. And that's what Acharya Tulsi um, and Mahapragya and Dr. Gandhi and I all stand in opposition to, along with all the other great non-violence educators that have been brought together over this last 25 years. You can read the declarations. They're in the book, a little book of peace declarations. Just Google it. Um, now I want to turn to a more sober and sad bit of news, which came to me last night. I rang a friend in the Pyrenees who told me that yesterday, or just recently, a French teacher here in France had been giving classes. He was a history teacher in a little suburb part of, near Paris about Islam. And he'd been, um, you know, trying to teach an objective, balanced class about what is Islam? Who was Muhammad? You know, why do people feel so strongly about him? And, and it, you know, the range of possible opinions, including the secularists that say, well, you know, we don't believe in God, we don't believe in prophecy, and, and therefore we reserve the right to sort of joke about this, to use humour. 
And he, I believe, was then showing the historical cartoons from Denmark that were published years ago, which caused a fatwa and lots of trouble, um, and led to people like Salman Rushdie and so on having to go into hiding. And, you know, there's this whole sort of we can't talk about this attitude. Now, this history teacher, and I'm a teacher as well, and my degree, first degrees in history, he... He said, no, we can't have this in 20, 2020 in France, Republican France, with a, a lake um, ethos in our school system. We intellectuals reserve the right to talk about anything, as long as we do it in moderation and fair-mindedness. Now, so far as I know, he was a qualified proper teacher teaching in that broad-minded way. Um, but one of the pupils in his class took offence, complained to his father... And the father came in and killed him in the school. You know, that's not, and not only that, but decapitated him gruesomely. You know, like as a sort of political statement, you talk about freedom of speech, we'll chop your head off. Um, this is a crisis here in, in France, literally as I speak. Macron went to the school, I think, yesterday and gave his deepest respects and He's, he knows that this is a real crisis. How are we going to respond to this kind of attack? Where would it end? What? So uh, it coincided, strangely enough, synchronistically, with my completing my commentary on the Quran. I've just spent 10 years writing a, a, you know, a spiritually informed, um, but also historically informed and critically um, uh, you know, informed commentary as a philosopher and historian on the entire Quran. Um, I actually still have a few surahs to finish, but I did finish the last Medinan surahs right up to the end uh, yesterday. And then I heard this news in the evening, which is like really bizarre synchronicity. You see, my commentary, uh, based on years of teaching about Islam, both in schools and universities, years of studying Islam, having dear friends who are Muslims, meeting very senior Muslim scholars in different universities, and teaching at the Muslim College in London, which is the place where they train imams, and it's the most sophisticated of Islamic uh, educational centres, I think, in Britain, or it was in my day, when Dr. Zaki Badawi used to run it. He's dead now, sadly. Um, so, you know, based on all that, I've done this commentary on the Quran, which took me ten years, and... I'm calling for a peace treaty between Islam and the West. I'm saying there need be no warfare, violence and hatred. What we should be doing is going back to the roots, going back to the sources, studying Islam and how it evolved and how its thinking developed as manifested in the Quran. And we should do this chronologically. So my commentary is very unique. It's the only one, I think, possibly in the whole of history, which studies Islam's key text, the Quran, chronologically. Now, I've done that because I'm a historian, so I want to see the evolution of the surahs and how they uh, change, developed, what's the tone, and setting each one against its historical context, what was going on politically, uh, religiously, what was going on in the life of Mecca and Medina and Muhammad's personal life, because the whole thing is a fascinating historical document. I don't know why this has never been done. I mean, I mean... It's as if, well, anyway, I, you know, I mean, our study of the Quran in the West is very old. Um, the first ever translation of the Quran into Latin was done by um, Peter the Venerable's team in the Abbey of Cluny in mid France, not far from me, in Burgundy. I've been to the ruins of Cluny Abbey, and it was done in the 1200s already, well, actually, the 1100s. Peter believed, like me, that the best way to advance peace and dialogue is to study each other's sacred texts. So he had a copy of the Quran brought from Spain in Arabic. He had scholars that could study Arabic. And they worked on it, and they translated it into Latin. Interesting enough, Peter was also the patron and, and um, host for uh, a poor uh, Peter Abelard, who'd been chased out of Paris, where he'd founded the University of Paris, calling for a rational approach to spirituality. And Peter called for a rational approach to biblical studies. He said that we have to subject the Bible to rational criticism and historical criticism. Um, and he had studied Aristotle in depth and knew that reason, intellect, 
has to be applied to these sacred scriptures. Otherwise, we end up with fanaticism. <coughs> and he said we should apply this to the Bible, but, but also to the Quran. I don't know that Peter Abelard himself ever read the Quran. It was not available until it was produced in Cluny. Um, and, but, of course, the Quran that they translated them, the text that we have, <coughs> is not in chronological order. The Quran that was assembled as a, a collection of writings after the death of Muhammad by order of a committee, which met in several stages and was finalized under um, Uthman, I believe, was then um, put into order of length of uh, surahs. So the, the longest at the front, gradually they get smaller and smaller. So now if you did that with the Bible, you'd get a very strange Bible. You'd have some of the big books like Genesis at the front, and then you'd have jumbled in the Minor Prophets, and you'd have bits of, you know, the Gospel. I mean, the Gospel of um, Mark is quite short, so that would be up, up you know, um, towards the end, and so on. The whole thing wouldn't make sense, because you need the chronological sequence or overview of the sacred text to make sense of it. And so, really, the Quran we've got is, is in a very odd sequence. Now, by doing it chronologically, as I've done, for the first time as a historian, I'm able to then reveal to the listener of the commentary that this surah is explicable by that sort of set of historical events and 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 I can show the evolution of the thought of Muhammad and how his thought changed. I mean, when he began his career as a preacher, mystic, visionary in Mecca, he was married to Khadija, he was happy, he was a successful merchant. He had, you know, um, <clears throat> a sort of inner quest, and he wanted to find ultimate truth, and, and it, he, it came to him. He had his downloads from the angel that he <clears throat> um, <clears throat> identified with Gabriel. And I go into great detail in the Quran commentary, which has taken 10 years. And why have I bothered with it? Because... Because as a lover of the Qur'an, as a lover of the Islamic tradition of philosophy and Sufism, as someone that's known and <clears throat> had dear friendships with many great Islamic thinkers, I feel a duty to share the knowledge that has come to me. You know, I, I'm not going to live forever. So if I put it down in writing, um, then it can live after I'm gone. <clears throat> and I, I've been really uniquely fortunate actually in my life to meet these amazing scholars um, you know Syed Hussein Nasser is another great influence on me who has been responsible for another great Quranic um, translation recently called the Study Quran which, which I've also used during my commentary but that one is in the traditional order it's not chronological what's unique about mine is it's a chronological sequence <clears throat> now what I would like <laughs> is that my Quran commentary could be studied in all schools and university wherever Islam is considered and studied. I think that if the poor history teacher who was beheaded a couple of days ago <coughs> had set some passages from my commentary to his classes and got them thinking about the nature of prophetic revelation and the nature of divine truth, and how these things are transmitted to us in our life. He would have got the students thinking, and that is the antidote to um, hatred.